I'm so thankful for this AYC local. Uh, it is a vision of Kansas District Youth President uh, Dusty Young to go out and minister to churches. Primarily they are doing this in church plants, of which we are one. I'm not sure how long we can keep claiming to be a church plant, but we'll claim it as long as it, it's uh, advantageous. But uh, we're thankful that all of you are here. And that's, this particular endeavor of AYC Local is a vision of the youth president, but it is ran by Trey Cornwell from Wichita, Kansas. And I'm going to invite him to come. And as he is coming, all of the, kill, the kids are going to stay in here for Children's Church. And so we're so thankful for Trey and uh, leading this team and all this endeavor. Why don't we give him a hand as he comes? Well, praise the Lord, everybody. Is anybody excited to be in the house of the Lord on a Sunday morning? Amen. We believe that when you come to the house of God, anything is possible. We believe in miracles, we believe in signs, and we believe in wonders. And we also believe that if you came to the house in need of something, we know that God can meet that need. Anybody believe that God still performs miracles? That didn't sound like you really believed that. Does anybody believe that Jesus Christ still performs miracles? Amen. How about we stand to our feet all across the house? And I'm getting ready to introduce our speaker, or our preacher for this morning. But if you came to the house of God and you have a need in your life, don't leave until you get that need. The Bible says that God is a rewarder of those that diligently seek after Him. And so if you will diligently seek after God this morning, there's no telling what will happen. How about we lift our hands to Jesus this morning as, as Brother Jackson prepares to come up here. And we're going to just pray that God would have his way. How about you join me in prayer this morning? Lord, we give you glory, we give you praise, and we give you honor. God, I pray in the name of Jesus Christ that you would manifest your miracles in the house tonight. Lord, there is somebody that came to the house of the Lord, and God, they have been battling a crippling depression. And Lord, I am asking, God, that the angels of the Lord would come into this house, that you would manifest your presence. God, there is somebody that came to the house of the Lord, and they've been battling anxiety. They've been battling sickness in their body. And so, Lord, I'm asking that you would show yourself God this morning. I pray that you would pour out the miracles of the Lord and let your spirit have his way. And everybody said amen. Amen. I have the privilege of introducing you to our preacher from the way of Fort Worth, Texas, and also by the way of Wichita, Kansas, Brother Jackson Case. Everybody say, God bless you, Brother Case. Well, praise be to God. How's everybody doing tonight, this morning? Sunday morning is uh, a, new, a new stomping ground for me, but I ain't going to hold back. Amen. Did you come to have to church today? Yeah? All right, let's go ahead and give the Lord some praise right now. Lord, we thank you, Jesus. You are mighty God. Hallelujah. We thank you, Jesus. We thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord. I believe I've come here with a word for Olathe, Kansas. Uh, quick introduction. Um, I give honor, to, uh, give honor to the pastor. I give honor to the staff. I give honor to everybody that's been uh, working diligently and uh, your labor's not in vain. Uh, you may be seated. Um, my name is Jackson Case. I was born in Wichita. I, uh, I grew up in Virginia. At 19, I decided to leave the house and uh, I packed a backpack full of clothes. Um, and uh, I had a handful of addiction. I had a handful of problems. I was depressed. I was angry at God. And uh, I ended up in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Stayed there for about four months, and I felt a tug. I felt a pull to Fort Worth, Texas. And from there, God filled me with the Holy Ghost. Deliverance took place. Every chain of bondage was broken. I never picked up drugs. I never picked up alcohol again. I never picked up another thing. 
God broke every chain of bondage in my life. And I believe that God could do that very same thing this morning. I believe that there is a miracle working God in the house this morning. I believe that there is a delivering God in this house this morning. And every weight that you feel right now, I believe is about to be lifted off of you in the name of Jesus Christ. Because once you receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, there's a peace that comes over you like never before. So all those countless nights where I just drank myself to sleep because I was drowning in my thoughts and in the pain that was just captivated in my heart was no longer a problem because Jesus said, I am your healer. I am your savior. He, said, he, he took all that pain and he pulled it out. So I used to say I was delivered from drugs and alcohol, but now I like to say I was delivered from pain. And he gave me peace and he gave me joy. Shortly after that, I met my wife. Uh, we got, I had to jump through 15,000 hoops to marry her. I jumped through 15,000 more, do it all over again. She couldn't be here today, her and my daughter, but that was the greatest heist of the century, was convincing her to marry me. So, praise God. Um, I do believe I have a word for Olathe, Kansas. And I have fought hell all week long for Olathe, Kansas. And uh, you just preach with me this morning. I'm not a very long-winded preacher, but I just, I just like, I like what I feel in this house this morning. The power of God is evident in this building today. The power of God is just as evident here as it was in Wichita last Wednesday. The power of God is just as evident now as it's been my entire walk with Jesus. I'll share a little bit more of my testimony here in a moment, but uh, I'd like to open up with a, uh, just a, a quote. I've never done this before, but Winston Churchill said, success is not final. Failure is not fatal. It is the courage to continue that counts. And uh, John chapter 11, 1 through 4. This is where my text comes from today. If you'd like to stand for the reading of the word, that's fine. When you have it, go ahead and say amen. If you don't, I believe they'll pull it up here. John 11, 1 through 4. The Bible says, Now a certain man was sick, named Lazarus of Bethany the town of Mary and her sister Martha. It was that Mary which anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. Therefore his sisters sent unto him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom thou lovest is sick. And when Jesus heard that, he said, the sickness it's not meant for death. But for the glory of God, that the Son of God might be glorified. Would you help me pray this morning, church, Lord, in the name of Jesus. God, I ask you, Lord, to move in this house. God, I ask you to move freely in this place. I pray that an anointing would come down right now like never before. Anoint these lips of clay. God, I rebuke fear, doubt, unbelief, and deception. God, I believe, Lord, that you are about to do something great. I believe that walls are coming down. I believe that chains are beginning to break. God, I believe that there is deliverance in this house this morning. I believe that something great is going to be evident that you are here in this place this morning. Jesus, have your way in me. Jesus, have your way in this congregation. And in the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. You may be seated this morning. For the next few moments, I'd like to preach, this isn't meant for death. This situation is not meant for death. Your past, it wasn't meant for death. Let's talk about something for a minute. You know, the story goes on, and, and uh, Jesus stayed where he was at for two more days. I was wondering why. A lot of people, they say that, that it's be, he was just waiting. He was waiting for Lazarus to die, be completely dead. It was customary for uh, Jewish culture to wait 
past three days and then roll the tomb, to roll the stone over the tomb. It was customary because they believed that the, the spirit would linger around the body for three days. And then after the third day, they'd roll the tomb, they'd pronounce that he was officially dead. So Jesus shows up and Martha comes to him and said, you know, Jesus, if you would have been there, he wouldn't even have died. You know why Jesus waited four days? He said, I needed him to die. He said, I needed him to die because he was saying, I could do more with something dead than something alive with no faith. He said, I could do something which you thought was dead. Like some of us and in our past situations. He said, I could do more with something that was dead than something alive with no faith. It was for the glory of God. Your past, it wasn't meant for death. Isaiah 43 and 2 says, I, even I, am am he that blotteth out thy transgressions for my own sake and will not remember thy sins. It doesn't matter what kind of background you have. It doesn't matter what kind of, of... anything that you have on your resume it doesn't matter the pedigree it doesn't matter the lineage that you come from it doesn't matter how you were raised up because everything that you've done it doesn't mean a thing when you're buried in his likeness and you're baptized in the name of Jesus and covered by the blood he said I will blot out thy sins Everything that you've done. He said, come unto me, all that have labored and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. He said, bring me your hurt. Bring me your pain. And cast it down at the feet of Jesus. That weight that you feel, it wasn't meant for you to bear. He said, cast it down at my feet, and I will deliver you. I will lift you up. I will give you a peace like never before. I will give you a joy like never before. I will restore you. I believe that hope is rising in this place. I believe that faith is rising in this place. Your trials, it wasn't meant for death. Isaiah 48 and 10 says, I have refined you, but not as silver is refined. Rather, I have refined you in the furnaces of suffering. Everything that you've gone through up to this point, it may have not made a whole lot of sense. But God, he knew what he was doing the entire time. He knew exactly what he was doing. See, you were, you were dealing with death and you were dealing with, uh, with uh, just, you were dealing with unfaithfulness in your life. You were dealing with doubt. You were, you were dealing with unbelief. And, and there were so many trials that began to pile up. But he said, I am, I am trying you for your faith. It's your faith that is being tested. It's your faith that is being tested. Everything that you've gone up, to, gone, gone up through, it, it doesn't matter. God has you exactly where you're supposed to be. You, my friend, are destined for greatness. You are all destined for greatness. Every one of you have a purpose uh, for the kingdom of God. Every one of you have a a purpose to worship the Lord. Uh, You just have to be thankful for something. For something. He said, your tribulation, it wasn't meant for death. Uh, Dear brothers and sisters, when troubles of any kind come your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy. For you know that when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. Your faith is being tested. Your faith is being tested. Your faith is being tested. That's it. That's it. And you are an overcomer by the blood of the lamb and the word of your testimony. Somebody's got a testimony in here today and you're holding back. You can't hold back your testimony. It's the trials of your faith, and it's all for the glory of God. Because you're coming out of this. You're coming out of this. Somebody look over at your neighbor and say, you're coming out of this. And Jesus is about to do something great in this house this morning. He's, I promise you, you will leave here differently than you came in. I'm in the Holy Ghost right now. That childhood trauma, it wasn't meant for death. The pain and heartache that you dealt with, uh, it, wasn't, it wasn't meant for death. You've, you, the, you dealt with it for so long, it was never meant to destroy you. But it was all for the glory of God. 
You see, there, there comes a time when you said, okay, God, I'm done. I'm giving up. That's where I was seven years ago. Whenever I left Virginia and I, I, uh, I went to Albuquerque, New Mexico, I literally just took a backpack and just, just shoved clothes in it. I don't even know what I packed. I said, all right, let's get out of here. Because I was fighting all the time in Virginia, and I was, I was just so angry. I was angry because of the death that I had dealt with. My grandfather had just died, and he was the only man in my life that I really felt like never disappointed me. He never, he never disappointed. He was a man of God. He was a preacher my whole life. My whole life, he just he preached the gospel. He preached, he preached apostolic oneness. He was a Pentecostal preacher. And uh, I can remember when I was little, three, four years old, looking up at him and, and, and saying, and uh, my sister had just sang Amazing Grace, and it was, wow, it was amazing. And maybe I said it because all the attention was going on her, but I looked at him and I said, you know, Grandpa, I said, I said, I said you know, Papa, I want to be a preacher just like you when I grow up. And then... And then it just seems like as soon as I said that, I just started fighting hell. Even at a young age, five, six, seven years old, it was like, it was like I just put a huge target on my back. Because then mom and dad, they, they get a divorce. And, you know, my dad, he's, he's a lot older than my mother. And he started fighting for, for custody. And, and she's fighting for custody. And. And it's just, you're seven years old, and there's just a tear between the two. And I don't wish that on any child. I don't wish that on anybody, in fact. But my grandpa, he was always, he was always knocking on the door. You coming to church this morning? For a while, most of my childhood, I went. And I started getting older. Started smoking pot. In Little League Baseball, 12. Then I kind of stopped. I stopped going. Praise God. And uh, I just, I quit going. And he'd knock. He, he never gave up. I can't help but to think that someone was prophesying that I would come to the house of God one day and I would fulfill what I said I wanted to be, what I said I, I, whenever I felt the call of the Lord. He, he's, I just can't help but think that someone was in that back room prophesying. There is power in prayer. There is power in fasting. You see, when I got the Holy Ghost, someone was praying and fasting for a whole week. There is power in prayer and power in fasting because here I was, my, my grandpa, he'd come and he'd keep banging on the door and now I've started drinking. I'm about 13, 14 years old and, I, and now I'm getting, in the, the old, I'm getting in the alcohol pretty heavy and I always wanted some sort of father-son bondage with my stepfather and it just wasn't there. So we became drinking buddies. He was more of a friend than a father. I learned a lot. I learned a lot how to not be like him. But in the midst of it, it was all for the glory of God. Because I knew that I would be somewhere today, like right now, and I would be sharing the story that it's not meant for death. Everything that you've gone through, it was never meant for death. It was never meant to tear you down. It was never meant to, to destroy you, but it was all for the glory of God. Someone just had to roll the stone and said, wake up, get up, it's time, fulfill the promises of God. So, Grandpa, he's banging on the door, and then finally, I'm 17, 16, 17, you come into church, I go and I stumble down the stairs, because conviction just, it was conviction the Lord was convicting my heart at even 17 because of what I said 10 years before. 
There is so much power in what you speak, so much power in what you, what you say. Whenever it's loose, there's, there's no turning back. When you speak something, you can't unspeak something. When you write something, you could erase it. But when you speak it into existence, the Bible says that there is life and death in the power of the tongue. That's why when you're filled with the Holy Ghost, He takes the most unruly member, the tongue, and you yield yourself and you give Him control of the tongue. So, he says, you come into church. And I go down there and my head's pounding. I said, no, Grandpa. I'm not going. He slams the door and he says, how are you going to be a preacher if you won't even come to church? Church, church, church. And I could still hear the resounding, the echo, just church. Echoing in the back of my mind because it just stuck with me and it was like a it was just like the Lord was just just trying to get it, get my attention. Just a few months later, he has a stroke. Goes completely out of his mind, gets dementia. Now I'm taking care of grandpa. Now I'm trying to get grandpa to church. When you're 17, 18 years old, that's, you're still too young to understand everything that's going on in your life. You're still too young to comprehend the reason life has dealt the cards that you're dealing with. And I left, I come back, and there was so much other stuff going on in my life, and and I just begin to drink so much and, 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 and just, I turned to opiates, I turned to pills, I turned to alcohol. I just kept, I just kept getting higher and higher and higher. And then, and then I would just, I would get so drunk that I knew that I had to pass out on my stomach because I was afraid if I fell asleep on my back that I would choke on my vomit. Wake up and there'd be piles of puke because I just wanted to forget everything that was going on. Then Grandpa dies, and it's like an old sad movie. I just pull a chair up in the middle of this empty house, and I sit there, and I just drink a fifth of whiskey. I'm just sitting there crying, bawling my eyes out. But God has a funny way of working things out for you. And uh, time passes. My dad, he's... He comes and he's like, why don't you come to Albuquerque, New Mexico? That's whenever I made it to Albuquerque. I shoved that backpack full of, full of clothes. And I, he, I was like, you know what? I got to figure it out. He said, yeah, you got to figure it out. Dad had very limited. He was very limited because the whole custody thing. I learned a lot from him. And uh, I get there to Albuquerque, and I knew I wasn't supposed to be there. Something began to pull and tug me into Fort Worth. When I get to Fort Worth, I'm sleeping in a shed in my sister's backyard. It's no AC. It gets hot in Texas. It gets hot in Kansas. It's no AC. I'm sleeping on a little futon. Then I found a mattress. I pull the mattress in there. I sleep on the little mattress on the floor. And uh, I'm literally at the lowest point in my life. And I was like, why am I here? Why am I in Fort Worth, Texas? And then my aunt, she contacts me. And her husband, he had died the same time that uh, my grandpa did. So she never really got to grieve for her father. And then we, we get there. Uh, she, she says, Jack, I want you to come to church. I said, ah, I'll give it a try. So I go, once in August. Go back to work. Go back to my drinking, doing my thing. If I showed you a picture today, you wouldn't even recognize me. And then uh, September, she says, Jack, why don't you come to church? I go to church. Nothing. I just couldn't figure out why all these people were smiling all the time. I said, what could be so good in their life right now that brings them so much joy that they won't stop smiling for four hours. And then October, 
I discovered the joy of the Lord. I discovered that that there was a God. But she didn't ask me to come to church. In this week that she had prayed and fasted, I worked third shift. I woke up and I go, I got to get it together. I shaved my face. I said, I want people to take me more serious. I I just look I look crazy right now because I didn't have a good beard. Some of you have great beards. I didn't have one. And then uh, I, just, I just started cleaning up. Like you were talking about this morning with sanctification, holiness. And it was just, it was just something that I was doing on my own. And, and I just started cleaning up. And, and I contacted her. And, uh, well, actually, she said, let's have breakfast, Jack. First off, couldn't figure out why she was awake at 6 a.m. on a Friday. And uh, she said, let's have breakfast. I said, okay. We go there. She broke her fast with me. She said, what are you doing here? And I said, if there's a God, that's why I'm here. I had little to no faith after everything that was going on. That It was never meant for death. You know, it was all for the glory of God. It was all to lift him up because that weekend, I fought hell. In fact, I went on a three-day drunk, two-day drunk. One was drunk in the Holy Ghost. So Friday night, I get drunk. Saturday, all day long, I get drunk. But fr- Sunday morning, I go to the altar, and I find myself at an altar of repentance with it, my hands lifted uh, and every chain of bondage begin to break. Uh, I'm telling you, I've been wide open ever since. Uh, I'm sharing this with you today because I believe that faith is rising in this place. Uh, if God could save me, he could save anybody. I'm telling you this today because uh, we have a delivering uh, Savior. We have a delivering God. Uh, he died for each and every one of us. Uh, he died so that chains could be broken. Uh, he died so that pain could be lifted. He died so that emptiness in your heart could be filled. He died so that you could receive peace. He died so that you could receive joy. We serve a miraculous God. I don't know what you're going through today. But I just want to let you know that your situation, it isn't meant for death. There's a lot of things that happen to us, uh, and we don't know why we go through it. Your setback is really just a setup for what God wants to do. First Peter uh, chapter 1, um, starting in verse 6 and 7, it says, Wherein ye greatly rejoice, uh, though now for a season, if need be, ye are in heaviness through manifold temptation, uh, that the trial of your faith, being much more precious uh, uh, than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire might be found unto praise and glory and honor at the appearing of Jesus Christ. But I like what the New Living Translation says. He says, so be truly glad. There is wonderful joy ahead. Even though you must endure many trials for a little while, these trials will show that your faith is genuine. It is being tested as fire tests and purifies gold, though your faith is far more precious than mere gold. So when your faith remains strong through many trials, it will bring you much praise and glory and honor on the day when Jesus Christ is revealed to the whole world. Uh, I feel the spirit of prophecy in this place. Uh, I believe that we need to open up our mouth uh, and confess with our tongue uh, what we want God to do. Uh, Prophesy that he is your strength. Uh, Philippians 4 and 13, I can do all things uh, through Christ for he who strengthens you. God will never call you into something that he is not fully willing and able to support you in. Uh, You alone may not have the strength But if you take your focus off of you and put it on the source of your strength, God the Almighty, you'll see that all things are truly possible with Him. When you feel alone, remember Deuteronomy 31 and 6, He will never leave you. He said, be strong and courageous. Do not fear or be in dread of them. For it is the Lord our God who goes with you. He will not leave you nor forsake you even during the darkest times 
of our lives, we can rest and know that God is with us. Even when we can't feel his presence, he's with us. Even when you feel like the walls are coming down and you can't feel him, he is with us. Even whenever you feel that the weight that is on you is just crushing you, he is in your presence. He is here with us right now. He is a deliverer. He is able to save. He is able to restore. He's a mighty working God. When you feel like this dead end road of your ministry is failing, you need to remember Jeremiah 29 and 11. He said, I have plans to prosper you. He said, I have plans to prosper. For I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord's plans to prosper you and not to harm you. It was never meant for death. Plans to give you hope and a future. God did not create you to just leave you and for you to live a mediocre life. He said it was never meant for death. He will never leave you. You have a purpose for the kingdom of God. You have a purpose in life. I believe that in Jesus' name. From the beginning of time, he knew you had a purpose. He said, I knew you before you were even in your mother's womb. He said, you have a purpose. You can step right into that purpose and the promise with the confidence of knowing that he knows what he's doing. When you feel like your prayers are hitting a wall and there's no way out or no way in or the bills just begin to pile up and all the pain and heartache just gets in your heart and you got to drown your alcohol, drown yourself with addiction and alcohol and pour yourself full of poison. God is with you. God is with you. He hears your prayers. He hears your prayers. He hears your prayers. He hears them. He says, then you will call on me and come and pray to me and I will listen to you. You will seek and find me when you seek me with all your heart. God promised that if, if, if we ask anything that is in line in the character of God and his purpose, he will answer. I don't know how. I don't know when. But he is a miraculous God. He is a covenant keeping God. I can assure you that he is a covenant keeping God. When you feel outnumbered, remember Exodus 14 and 14. He will fight for you. The Lord himself will fight for you. You just got to stay calm. Just like the Lord fought for the Israelites, he's going to fight for each and every one of you today. In all those times when you're, when you're clueless on how to handle a situation, he's going to fight for you. When you feel overwhelmed... He's going to give you peace. When you feel the pressure of everything, He's going to give you peace. Just because you had a bad year or you don't have enough to cover the bills, you got to remember John 14 and 27. He said, he will give you peace. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. He did not give us a spirit of fear. He gave us peace and a sound mind. Somebody needs to speak to their situation. Somebody needs to speak to a mountain and say, be moved. Someone needs to say, Lazarus, get up. It was never meant for death. Someone needs to speak and say, he's not sick. He's just asleep. And say, rise, Lazarus. Rise, Lazarus, because it's just a testing of your faith. When you feel like everyone you ever loved was walked out, you need to remember Ephesians 3 and 19. He will always love you. He said, may you experience the love of Christ, though it is too great to understand fully. Then you will be made complete with all the fullness of life and power that comes from God. Time to take off the spirit of heaviness and put on a garment of praise. He's a covenant keeping God. This one's not in the notes. He's a covenant-keeping God. I believe it's Genesis 15. God comes to Abram in a vision. It was after he was talking about the promise and how he was going to be a father of many nations. So he's still Abram. And uh, the Lord comes to him in a vision, and he says... He says... He says, Abram, get me a heifer of three years. He says, get me a she-goat of three years. He said, get me a ram 
He said, get me a turtle dove. And he said, get me a pigeon. Immediately, Abram gets up. He gets those animals and he cuts them in half and he lays them on the altar because he knew exactly what God was calling for. If you ever heard the term to cut a deal, it comes from cutting a covenant. And this is what they did in this day. They would take an animal and they would cut it in half and they'd put one, side of, one, one part of the animal on this side of the altar and then they'd go over here and they'd put one, one animal on this side. And they would create a path of blood in between it. And the two people would walk in between this. So Abram takes the, the heifer, the goat, the ram, the turtle dove, and the pigeon, and he makes this path. And he spreads the blood across it because he knew what God was calling for. And God is not a covenant-breaking God. And the blood is shed, and then he goes into a deep sleep, the Bible says, and then he wakes up, and there is a smoking furnace and a burning lamp going through this path alone. See, when they made this, this covenant, this, this path, they would walk down it together, and what this was saying, or one would walk immediately after the other, and what this was saying was... If I don't keep my end of the deal, let my body be like this. If I don't keep my end of the deal, let my blood be shed just like this. If I don't keep my end of the covenant, sacrifice me like these animals. That's how much of a value of a covenant was. The value of a covenant couldn't be matched. So when Abram wakes up and he sees the smoking furnace and the burning lamp... Remember, it was fire coming off the mount, the smoke coming off the mount. It was the Lord was walking through this covenant alone. He says, if I don't keep my end of the covenant, Abram, he said, let my body be split in two like this. Let my blood be shed like this. But he went a step further. He said, Abram, if you don't keep your end of the covenant, still let my body be like these animals. Let my blood be shed like these. So man keeps sinning and, 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 and all this and that. And you know, there's 400 years of silence in between the Old and the New Testament. And then on Calvary, the covenant was fulfilled. The promise that God had made, he said, if you fall, Abram, or if your people fall, Abram, uh, still let my body be like yours. I'm taking your place. Jesus died for each and every one of us because one part of his body was here uh, and the other part and the blood shed on the cross at Calvary. And I'm telling you, it doesn't matter what you've done, where you've been, or where you thought you were headed, that he is a covenant-keeping God, and that he is a promise keeper. And I promise you this, that it was never meant for death, because he too was even resurrected. Jesus is in this place this morning. Sometimes it takes a little bit of going through something to connect with someone. It was never meant for death. But I feel like I still need to give you more scripture. 1 Corinthians 10 and 13. There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but will with the temptation also make a way of escape. There's always going to be an escape. When you face the trial, when you face the temptation, there is a way of escape. He said, a way to escape that ye may be able to bear it. So what am I saying? Is when you walk into this land and you feel like there's giants, like you talked about this morning, Pastor, when, when you feel like there's giants and they said that, that we feel like we're grasshoppers in their eyes. When, when all that happens, all you have to do huh, is not worry about a thing. It's easier said than done, ain't it? Well, Caleb come from the tribe of Judah. 
And Judah means praise. So in my situation, I'm going to praise the Lord. In my situation, I'm going to find joy. In my situation, I'm going to give him a reason to dance. I'm going to give him a reason to shout. I'm going to get a reason to say, Lord, you've been so good. You've been so good to me, Lord. I magnify and glorify your holy name because there is no one greater than the King of Kings. There is no one greater than the Lord of Lords, the Prince of Peace. The everlasting Father, Jehovah Jireh, Jehovah Nisi, He is the Almighty God. I believe that there is something in here breaking right now. And I'm going to remind myself that He ain't going to put nothing in front of me that I can't bear. Or all I got to do is find a way of escape. And I'm going to praise my way out of it. I'm going to praise my way out of it. You see, there's two things. That can happen. That's going to happen when you fall because we all fall at some point. You either fall, even if it's just for a notch. You're either going to fall away from God and feel like He's turned His back on you. Or you're going to fall to your knees, maybe even your face, until God changes your perspective on yourself. Revival starts in each and every one of you. Revival starts in you. Back in Psalms 51, we see this ultimate chapter of repentance. We know that David fell into sin with Bathsheba, and then he went and had the guy, you know, he sent him out on the front lines, had him murdered. But, you know, it was just his little dirty little secret. And uh, he says, when I close my eyes, my sin is there. He says, when I open my eyes, my my sin is there. When I sleep, my sin is there. Everywhere I turn, my sin is ever before me. When I open my eyes, it's everywhere. It's everywhere. Psalms 51, he says, Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness. According unto the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. How many of us been there? Just blot them out. Get rid of them. Wash me thoroughly from mine iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against thee and thee only have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight. That you mightest be justified when thou speakest and be clear when thou judgest. Behold, I was shapen in iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, thou desirest truth in the inward parts. And in the hidden part, thou shalt make me to know wisdom. He said, purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. He said, hide thy face from my sins and blot out all of mine iniquities. Create in me, O God. A clean heart and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. He said, Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. The joy is in the salvation. He said, Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation and uphold me with thy free spirit. Then will I teach transgressors thy ways and sinners shall be converted unto thee. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God. Thou God of my salvation, it was never meant for death. And my tongue shall sing aloud of thy righteousness. He said, I'm going to praise my way out. He said, I'm going to praise my way out. Whenever I see this temptation, I'm going to praise the Lord. He said, O Lord, open thou my lips, and my mouth shall show forth thy praise. For thou desirest not sacrifice, else would I give it. Thou delightest not in burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit. He said, bring me your brokenness. He said, bring me your pain. Bring me your hurt today and lay it on the altar. A broken and contrite heart, O God, thou wilt not despise. Do good in thy good pleasure unto Zion. Build thou the walls of Jerusalem. Then shalt thou be pleased with the sacrifices of righteousness, with burnt offering and 
whole burnt offering, then shall they offer bullocks upon thine altar. Musicians, come. I'm coming to a close. Everything that you've been through, everything that you're going through, was never meant for death. It was all for the glory of God in some sort of way, and you just had to find it. You just had to find that the reason to dance, the reason to praise, the reason to lift Him up. You could stand to your feet. Because I don't know how many times that I had felt all alone, even in this walk with God. But it was in so many countless times in the Bible where people were alone and God wanted to get their attention. He said, just like Moses in the burning bush, he was all by himself. Jonah in the well, by himself. Esther in the palace just by herself. Jesus in the garden. There's seasons of loneliness in our life. They're not meant for death. God's just trying to get our attention to speak to us. And when there's so much noise, so much pressure surrounding us, God will just take you and just... You can hear me now. He says, it'll be, it'll be so clear. And you never second guess what God's trying to say, you know, because you just know. When you know, you know. You know? I can't tell you how many times I wanted to give up and just throw in the towel in this walk with God. In ministry, didn't feel like things were going the way that I thought they should. Sometimes I feel like, you know, when I left Virginia and I went to Albuquerque and I was all alone, it felt like. I even found myself suffering from suicidal thoughts and just, and it was crazy. It just crept in. I just was making a bed one day in my sister's house, just trying to straighten up, clean up for her. And I find a bed, under, a gun under the bed, and then those thoughts just started. The only thing that was holding me back was just seeing, like, my family, like my sister, or the kids, if they was to come in and see all that. But I, too, dealt with pain for a long time. But God just had to get me by myself so that I would be obedient and listen. I know about the addiction. I know about the broken homes. I know, I know about all those things. And I shared with most of those with you. So I believe that God has come to, to restore in us the joy of thy salvation. So if you want to make your way to this altar, that's totally up to you, but God's going to do something. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. You are worthy, God. You are worthy to be lifted. Weight is going to be lifted off of you when you leave this place. Pain is going to leave your heart. And the emptiness that you feel right now is about to be filled. There's a void that you've been trying to drown out with pills and alcohol and all it's done is just create more pain. But God is about to fill the emptiness right now. Jesus, you are worthy to be lifted. You are worthy to be praised, God. There's none greater than you, for you are worthy, Jesus. You are worthy to be lifted up, God. God, lift a, lift a weight off of these people, Lord. A spirit of heaviness, Lord Jesus, so that they would put on a garment of praise. Lord.